let me grab my thingy. I'm using this as a visual today. Thank you, brother. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Mr. Batman. Good afternoon, boys and girls. That's what my students used to say. I'm going to put this thing here on. This is called a tallit. This is a prayer tent. This is what Paul was making when he was making tents. All right. I don't think Paul had a cool bucket hat like this, but I do. You know, it's so cool. We should be different. We should be different than the rest of the world. You know what the rest of the world does? Complain about everything. <laughs> you know, I already had it in my mind what I was going to say when I got up here. And then I heard the few words come first few words coming out of Brother Sonny's mouth. I said, uh oh, that ain't what I'm talking about today, is it? <laughs> you know, our God is so good. And we sometimes forget how good he is. You know what? I've, I've just had cancer. Yay, big deal. But I used that cancer to reach everybody on my cancer team. Well, wait a minute. Well, when they told me my numbers, this PSA number thingy was supposed to not be above four, eight, 12 was freaking out. Mine was 35. I'm an overachiever. They're like, oh, he's going to die. I said, uh, no, I'm not dying yet. God's got more stuff for me to do. Don't know where it's at. Don't know what it is. Maybe it's right here but I'm not letting one opportunity escape me. And so what I did is every time I walked in that place, I made sure I had a smile on my face. I made sure I had my Bible with me. They thought I was reading Harry Potter. <laughs> I literally had one lady, one of the nurses asked me, is that your Harry Potter book? I said, no, ma'am. So my pastor and I were having a theological discussion. He believes one way, I believe another. We're going to talk to each other about it. And this is the word of the living God. Well, she was not very impressed with that. Matter of fact, she was taking me back to go do a radiation treatment. And part of that radiation treatment, you have to be in certain conditions. So she looks at me, she goes, is your bladder full? So that's a good way to segue out of that conversation. Well, the next day I come in wearing a shirt, a shirt with two Hebrew symbols on it. The Hebrew symbols are Aleph and Tav. What are those? The first letter of the Hebrew language and the last letter of the Hebrew language. It's exactly the same thing as being the alpha and the omega in the Greek. It's the aleph and the tav. But why did I want to wear the paleo Hebrew symbols? Because one is a symbol of the bull, the strong leader, the head of the house. It's a symbol of the father. And then the other one literally is the cross. Back in paleo Hebrew, when they did covenants, it was a symbol of a cross. And so aleph and tav, the father and the sun. Wow, it didn't get much better than that. So I wore that shirt in there and she's eyeballing that shirt. Oh, what is that? What is that? So finally, after I get my treatment done, I'm getting down off the table and she goes, okay, I got to ask, what's the deal with the shirt? I said, oh, I'm so glad you asked. It's just like in the Bible where it says the alpha and the omega, this is the aleph and the tav. And I started going on and on. You know, I, when I get going, I don't shut up very well. But it was so funny because she's sitting there going, oh, man, I had to ask. But there was one of the nurses standing behind her going, yeah. <laughs> so I thought, OK, good. But you know what? I did 44 of those radiation treatments. At the end of them, even the Buddhist doctor came out and applauded because he said, you've got a great attitude. I said, I've only got a great attitude because I've got a great king. I've got a king who loves me. He never leave me. He'll never forsake me. And because of that. I want to tell you about him. I walked in there for my last treatment and the lady, she was something else. The, uh, the greeter at Schneck Medical Cancer Center. I told her, I said, ma'am, I've been in here 56 times. You have been here in here and greeted me with a smiling, lovely face every single time except one. And she goes, oh, well, thank you. I said, no, I want to thank you because you made this not as bad as it could be. You know, cancer sucks, but Schneck Medical Cancer Center makes it suck less. But I couldn't imagine going through any of this 
without my king, knowing that everything that we go through has a purpose. I, I, I love where I'm going to church right now. I'm going to give a shout out to my little church. Not so little anymore. They're growing like weeds. But Turning Point in Scottsburg, Indiana. Wow. I love those people. They're people of not just second and third chances. They're people of seventh and eighth and tenth chances. That's what I needed. And they really love God. Now, I can say that. And they don't believe like I believe. I mean, look at me. I'm wearing a tallit. How many Christians you know wear these things? I don't know of any. I'm wearing zit zits. How many of the Christians you know wear that? None. I keep the Sabbath. We were talking about Sabbath and how important Sabbath is today at service. Well, how many people actually keep the Sabbath? Very few. But you know what? That's not what it's about. It's about our king and how we individually can have a better relationship with our king. You know what? I'm at a different point in my walk than you guys are. You know, I've been doing this... Yes, and I'm going to admit it, for 50 years, five decades, half a century. Wow. And you know what? I have just scratched the surface of what's in this book. I have just scratched the surface of how much the God of creation, the God of salvation, not only loves us and me, which I can't understand how he could do that, but he does. Wow, that's my king. But you know what this world teaches our kids? that they are nothing more than evolved pond scum. That, oh, by the way, since you are nothing more than evolved pond scum, what difference does it make what one pile of evolved pond scum does to a, another pile of evolved pond scum? That's called morality. See, when you go down that path of evolution, oh, and some people say science, then you cannot have God. Guess what? Science you cannot do without the God of the Bible. Because one of the things I used to do is I used to be a professional debater. You know, I haven't lost a, a debate in probably eight, ten years. Not because I got so smart, because I'm not. It's only because I recognize the truth. If you understand that every word in this book is the truth, and that Jesus walked out this word perfectly, it says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, it says, for he fulfilled it. He said, do not think that I've come to abolish the laws and the prophets, for I've not come to abolish, but to fulfill. He did it all perfectly. Why? To show us that we can walk in his steps, because he literally tells us to walk as he walks. In, uh, I believe it's 1 John, 2 John chapter, uh, well, there's only one, 2 John chapter 1, verse 6. It says, for this is love that we walk according to his commandments. And this is not a new commandment. Nope. It's the one you've heard from the beginning, that you should walk as he walks. Wow. First time I did a study on that, that word phrase, to walk in. Think about this. How much does God want to bless you? A little bit? A whole lot? Somewhere in between? You know, that's completely up to us. How much God blesses us is in our hands. Because he literally says, oh, guess what? I put before you this day life and death. That's the Bible. I call it Torah. I put before you this day blessings and curses. That's the Torah. Life and blessings if you will obey the Bible, the word of the living God. Death and curses if you will not. So you want to be blessed? Well, I would recommend that you read Psalm 1, or 19 would be another one, but Psalm 119. How happy are those whose way, way is blameless. Blameless. I'll get it out here in a second. How happy are those whose way is blameless, who live according to the Torah of Yahweh. Happy are those who keep his decrees and seek him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong. They follow his ways. Now, does that mean we can be perfect? Actually, yeah, it does. But we've got a bad definition of perfect. Perfect in this state, in Hebrew, does not mean without flaw. It means filled with integrity. Excuse me. 
filled with integrity. That's what David was. When David, he said, be per- God said, be perfect and walk before me. Abraham was perfect and walked before me. He said that about Abraham. He wasn't perfect. They all had flaws, but they walked filled with integrity. What's that mean? When you mess up, when I mess up, point to me now, when I mess up, I want to own it. I don't want it. I didn't mean to do it. Maybe I did mean to do it, but now I know it's wrong. I'm going to fess up. I'm going to say, guess what? It is wrong. And I need to correct things. And not only am I going to man up and say, yes, I'm the man like David did. I'm also going to say, wow, what do I have to do differently? Where do I need to look to see how to do it the way Christ did it? It's not that hard. We just have to want to do it. We have to have a desire in our heart. And that Holy Spirit, when that Holy Spirit comes to be a part of you, it says in uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, when the Holy Spirit comes to abide in you, you cannot sin anymore. Question, am I still sinning today? Why, yes, I am. Does that mean I don't have the Holy Spirit? No, I don't have the fullness of the Holy Spirit yet. See, God blesses us and he gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us that spirit. And it's uh, when we think about this, the spirit of the living God, the power of the living God, the communication of the living God. He communicates with us through that spirit. And if you squelch that spirit, you're not going to be able to hear his still small voice that says, I want to talk to you. I want to have a relationship with you. But I can't if you won't listen to me. How do we listen to God? We read his word. We meditate on it day and night. And also in Psalms, it says, when the man meditates on the word day and night, the law, the Torah, day and night, guess what he is? He's like a tree planted by streams of water whose leaf never withers. And he always gives the fruit in the appropriate season. Wow. He's always bearing fruit when he's supposed to. I wish I could do that. Half the time, the fruit I bear is like, I make people mad. I, I, I'm good at this. I've always done it. But, you know, my pastor, he's challenging me on a regular basis. One of the things he said today that I'm going to take and make my own, I do that whenever he says something really interesting. I make it my own. But anyway, he said, we don't burn bridges. We build them. I got to say, that's never been my motto. My motto was the reverse of that prior to that. Oh, you don't like what I say? You don't like what I do? I'm going to burn the bridge. I ain't talking to you no more. Goodbye. But you know what? We can't do that. We all have to understand we all do not have it perfectly right. I don't. Nobody does. But the only thing we do have perfectly right is this, the book, the book, the book. This is it. This should be our instruction manual. And what really gets me is you'll have people say, well, yeah, I I love Jesus. I do. Oh, I just couldn't get out of bed this morning. Uh, St. Mattress, you know, the church at St. Mattress was really interesting today. What? How do you, you know what? I I used to think, well, if I don't show up, somebody's going to be left out not getting some information that only I have. That's not prideful, is it? (laughs) Only slightly. But you know what? That is partially true. When you don't show up at church, there was somebody that God wanted you to speak to that day and you didn't do it. You didn't hear the unction of the Holy Spirit because you weren't in the pew. You weren't in the house of the living God. How can you hear what he wants you to do if you're not willing to get up and go to his house? See, you got to leave your house. You got to come to his house. And we want that. Because when... Christ was asked, oh, what's the matter? Where, what's going? What's going on? Are you going to leave us? He goes, yes, I go to my father's house to prepare a place for you. Wow. But we look at that and we think, well, that's pretty neat. God's going to prepare me a little apartment. No, this is actually wedding terminology that we truly don't understand unless you study the ancient wedding, ancient Hebrew wedding ceremony. See, what would happen is when you got the groom and the bride, they would be worked out what's called a ketubah, a wedding contract. Once that contract was worked out and the proposal was accepted, oh yeah, that's when it says in Revelation, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. That's a proposal. 
right there. Because when the, the contract was finalized, the groom and the father of the groom would go back to their home and come back to the bride's house unannounced. So every time between those two points, every time somebody knocked on the door, the father has to look out the window first. Because if he makes a mistake and opens the door, that's an acceptance of the proposal. Wow. So the proposal has been accepted by the supposed bride, us, the ones who believe God enough to do what he says to do, the way he says to do it on the day he says to do it. Yes, very important. But, okay, what, what's he going to do? Well, the groom, after the proposal is accepted, goes back to the father's house and prepare something called a chupa. I love saying that word because <laughs> you got to get the in there. The chupa is a staying place. It's the new couple's home that's built on to the father's house. Wow. Okay, great. That's awesome. Does it get any better? Yes, it does. I'm glad you asked. Because guess what now? Now, when is going to be the sign of your return? Well, we're all seeing st stuff everywhere today. We're like, whoo, Jesus come back soon. We can see it happening. But guess what? Yeshua says, no man knows the day or the hour. And that's true. No man does. Only the father does. Well, wait a minute. How's this part of wedding terminology? Because the father is responsible for watching over the construction of the hoopah that his son is doing, which is the, the staying place. But guess what else he does? He keeps tabs on the bride. Who's the bride? We are. We're supposed to be anyway. We're supposed to love God enough to be the bride. But wait a minute. What is the father of the groom? What's he watching for on that bride? Well, in the book of the Revelation it tells us the white garment of righteousness. Why do ladies wear a white wedding dress? Because the Bible infers that that's what will happen when Christ returns and he gathers his bride. If she's not wearing the white garment of righteousness, then she's not going to be chosen. The parable of the ten virgins, the five wise, the five foolish. I always used to think the five foolish ones were atheists because I used to be an atheist. I thought, well, that, you know, that makes sense. They're foolish. And the fool says in his heart, there is no God. But wait a minute. When is ever an atheist waited on God? I know when I was an atheist, I never did. So that kind of put a kibosh on that thought. So I got to thinking, hmm, what's the difference between these two people groups? Well, the five wise ones, they have extra oil. Okay, well, everything in the Bible points to Jesus. Somehow, some way, Yeshua is at the center of everything. The volume of the book speaks of him. Okay, so how does this speak of him? Because these five wise virgins understood that they need to study the word of that living God, to love him by understanding that there's going to be times in our lives we're going to go through some tough stuff like cancer, like divorce, like your kids not wanting to be around you, guilty as charged. But you know what? That's okay. Because we can look at it one of two ways. Oh, Satan's got a hold of me now. I just don't know what I'm going to do. Oh, wait a minute. That puts an awful lot of power in Satan's hands, don't it? Hmm. No, no. I'm going to go with Deuteronomy 8 too. This is where God says, you know what? This time that you're going through, this time of testing, this is your time in the desert to see if you love God enough to do what he says to do the way he says to do it. You see, once we recognize that God has a plan for us, then we should do it. So these five wise ones, they did everything they were supposed to do. They went through tribulation because, again, what's the oil made out of? Olive, olive oil, that's what it is. How do you get the olive oil? By being crushed. That word in the Greek is phlebo, which literally means tribulation. These women went through tribulation but held on to their king and understood that no matter what happens, he's got them. Nothing can snatch them out of his hand. Nothing. That, that is something else. I didn't really understand that. I still don't completely understand it. Because I see people like my friend John Lowry. This man, he's been a powerful man of God for a long, long time. Been a pastor, youth pastor. Everybody knows him. Well, he got diagnosed with cancer. And I'm like, whew, that's a lot worse kind of cancer than I got. Oh, man. 
Oh, man, he's probably really boo-hooing. Nope. He was looking forward to going home. He's like, yeah, my stuff's done here. I'm getting ready to go see my king. And then you know what happened? He got healed. He said, darn, I got more work to do. I love that kind of attitude. He's going to do what God tells him to do. And God tells us all to do different things, but the same way. We're all supposed to reach the people that we have ultimate control or ultimate interaction with. I won't say control because none of us control anybody, even ourselves. We don't even do that very well. I'm going to point to me. I don't do that very well. But, wow, if, if we're going to look at this and say, you know what? My king allowed this to happen in my life. John, he, people are praying for him. And he's like, that's great. I want you to be praying for me. But know for a fact, if God keeps me here another 10 years, or if God brings me home in 10 minutes, I don't care. Because I'm doing what my king says, no matter which way it happens. Wow, that's awesome. I wish I could be like that. But I get myself in the way too often. You know, I think I know so much. I really do. I'm a prideful guy. At least I can admit it. I just know one thing. That knowledge can sometimes get in the way. You can know things without truly knowing something. Let me give you an example. I know this book. I've read it a number of times, studied it, memorized it. But I do not know this book the way I know my wife that is an intimate relationship. Wow. We're supposed to have an intimate relationship with the king through his word. And until I recognized that, I was still living life the way I wanted to live it. I was still saying, oh, you know what, God, it's okay. Don't worry. Don't worry about me, you know, getting drunk. Don't, don't worry about my witness at the bar. You know, I'm witnessing to those people at the bar. Yeah, I'm witness, I'm witness and I can drink more than they can. Wow. That's not a good witness. We need to be the opposite. We need to be the one that's there, that's there when they wake up on the hangover and says, hey, how you feeling? You want to you wanna stop feeling like this? You want to wake up every single day with a hangover? I don't. You want to wake up between two buildings, not knowing what two buildings you are between? I've done that before. Well, why? Because when you're living like that, you're trying to kill some pain. What pain are you trying to kill? The pain of your guilt. When I was doing that stuff, I just wanted to be high or drunk or, or something all the time because I knew I was guilty. I lived, I was, I was so uptight all the time. People think I'm still uptight. They don't really know how much I've changed. But anyway, but something, something happened here recently when I went through this cancer stuff. I, I want to say I trust God, and I do, but sometimes we all have our doubts. I believe God, but help my unbelief is what it says. When I was up there in that intensive care, and they'd given me some kind of medicine to bring my blood pressure up, went right in my heart or something. Anyway, I had a migraine. I thought my head was going to explode. I was already in a ton of pain anyway. And I called out to God. I said, God, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why I'm here. I just know that I'm leaking out the Holy Spirit faster than you're currently pouring it in. I need you. And you know what? He did. Bam! Immediately. I started to weep. And then I started to laugh. And that's when the nurses came in because they thought I was going to croak. But God had other plans. As a matter of fact, God says, you, you can't stay here long. You got stuff to do. Because they told me I was going to be in there two weeks. Three days. I said, Doc, what do I got to, what I got to do to get out of here by the, before Christmas? Christmas was three days away. What do I got to do to get out of here before Christmas? He literally said, you have to have a miraculous recovery. When he's signing my discharge paper, I said, Doc, what did I have? He said, a miraculous recovery. I said, that's the king that I serve. A king that loves. What is love? Love is doing the right thing by the people that are in your life. You know what? I used to tell people, you're going to hell because you don't follow the word of the living God. Well, that might be true, but that's not the way to address it. You're going to hell because you don't believe everything in here that I believe. I used to say that stuff. But you know what? That's not true either. Because we serve a king and he 
makes those decisions. I don't. And you know what? I don't even want to get in that line. I don't. I just want to be there to open the door for everybody else who wants to come into the kingdom. That's it. If all I am is a door holder, I'm good with that. Because this knowledge can get in the way. Knowledge can puff up. Oh, and have I been puffed up? But you know what about being puffed up? When you get deflated, whoo, that's a hard, hard lesson to learn. And unfortunately, God's had to teach it to me a few times. But I just want to pretty much close with this. When we look at how our king, Avinu Makenu, our father, our king, that's what that is in Hebrew. When we look at our king who stepped out of eternity, stepped off of his perfect throne and became a man to die. Let's make it personal for me. Why would he do that? I wouldn't die for me. Yet he did. Wow. Okay. So now what do we have to do? What do we have to do? Is there anything we have to do? Well, actually, yes, there is. Because we want to hear some certain words. We want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the rest of your master. Wow. I want to hear those words. I do not want to hear those words. Away from me, you worker of lawlessness, iniquity. I never knew you. You know what? I used to think that God didn't know these people, but that's not what that word no means. It means an intimate relationship. They did not have an intimate relationship with him and he did not have one with them. So knowledge is an intimate relationship. And one last thing, and I'll point, and I'm going to close here. I said that twice now, anyway. And that is the garden, the garden of Eden. We got the two trees. We got the tree of life. What's that? Well, that's the king. That's God. That's, that's the perfect way to live, the tree of life. And the trees represent a teaching or a person and a fruit that we eat is what we take in, the teaching of that person. Okay? So that's God's teaching. Do we eat the fruit of that tree, the tree of life? Or is it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? See, here's where our translations don't help us. We really need to look at this as what is this tree? It's mixture. Do you know our God hates mixture? He wants purity. He wants a pure heart. He doesn't want to mix with anything evil. So what is this tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Well, isn't good good? Well, yes. Well, isn't evil evil? Wait a minute. What's the problem here? Because when we are eating of that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We are engaging in an intimate relationship with both good and evil simultaneously. Are we ever supposed to do that? Let me give you an example how this is working in the modern day church. I don't know what denomination it is. I don't I quit looking. But where they're going to marry homosexual people, uh, put transgender people in p- positions of leadership, all these different things like this, blatantly going against the word of the living God. I wouldn't want to be them, but that is exactly what it is. They have said, you know what? Yes, this book says one thing, but it's old and out of date. And so now we need to update this. You know, truth never changes and absolute truth absolutely never changes. Well, on that note, I want you to know that there's one king and that one king, he died for you. He died for you. He died for you. He died for me. And you know what? Because he died for us, we should live for him the way he wants us to. He literally says, if you love me, go out and do it your own way. Is that what he said? If you love me, uh, go on to the bar. No, no. If you love me, you will. And that word guard or keep right there doesn't do it. It's the word should be a military term. It's to guard. You put your best people around that. You're going to keep it. You're going to follow it. Very simple. Because when we do these things, they evidence to everybody else that we're not like the rest of the world. Now, it's easy to see that I'm not like the rest of the world. I'm Batman. Heck, that's crazy enough. But, you know, if you don't read the Bible the way I do and you you think, well, I don't think it says zeet zeets need to be worn. Okay. That's cool. I'm good with that. 
I read it a little differently, so I'm going to do things a little differently. If you read the Bible and think it's okay um, to work on the Sabbath, that's okay. That's between you and God. The Bible literally says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I don't have to work out yours. You don't have to work out mine because we don't need to complain about one another. But what we do need to do is we need to point to this perfect book. And when somebody says, guess what? You're doing something wrong. Oh, great. I don't want your opinion. Thank you very much. Proverbs 18 two: the fool has no desire for understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. You know, I used to teach science and this is a little known science fact. Do you know opinions are just like rectums? We all have them. They all stink. I'm not interested in yours and I don't want you interested in mine. Pretty cut to the chase right there. But so again, if we want, if we want the truth, then we have to know where to look. This word is true. You can trust it. You can do it. It's not too difficult. It's not too far away. It's not across the sea where you have to some, send somebody to go get it so we can do it. It's right here. You know, God originally wrote the law in stone. So the new commandment, the new covenant, rather, all the same laws are part of the new covenant. Huh. Well, what's the difference? Better terms for us. Instead of just writing it on a piece of rock and us have to go read it, where does he write the law this time? On our hearts so we can do it. If we love him, we will keep his commandments. And I don't care if we've been doing something wrong for 20 minutes, 20 centuries, or, or 20 decades. I don't care. If we figure out we're doing it wrong, we need to be able to man up and say, you know what? I'm the man. I messed it up. I'm going to do it right this time. Remember, God is waiting for us to turn from our wicked ways and walk as he walks. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate it. Are you next, Mr. Cash?